It's a little trip down memory lane for you. That was from 2008. And we were taking a little trip down memory lane last night uh, as Barack Obama spoke to the convention, not only about 2008, but about, about 2004. His arc, of course, has been one spread across conventions. We're going to talk today about the Democratic National Convention and then about also the dramas unfolding on at least one parallel track. That would be the Donald Trump track. Um, and boy, if we got a lineup for you, really, if I had to pick four people uh, who are at the convention that I would like to talk to, uh, people who are journalists whom I respect and who are fun to talk to, I couldn't come up with four better people. Not only that, but I'm sitting here in air-conditioned com- comfort while they're miserable in Philadelphia, uh, most of them anyway. Uh, joining us now, uh, Tim Noah, labor and employment editor for Politico and the author of The Great Divergence Among America's, uh, excuse me, America's growing inequality crisis and what we can do about it. And Margaret Carlson, columnist for the Bloomberg View. Joining us later, Brian Curtis, editor-at-large at The Ringer, and Alexandra Petri, uh, who is emerging as one of the great comic voices in American journalism. She writes the Compost blog for The Washington Post. Anyway, you'll meet uh, the, the latter two of them later. We've got Tim and Margaret with us right now, uh, and uh, they're both people that I enjoy talking to about this stuff. Margaret and I have even covered a convention or two together. Although, Margaret, that mostly involved adjudicating disputes between you and the Mondrian Hotel, uh, as I recall. (laughs) Or Bill Curry. Uh, Yeah, or Bill Curry. Um, So I want to begin with uh, both of you about, I mean, not for nothing did we begin with that song, because there have certainly been many storylines at the convention already. Although, I mean, last night they they put some of their all-stars out and and, and certainly uh, ended with their ultimate uh, all-star. And um, so uh, I'm going to ask both of you about this. But it seemed to me that One of the things that Barack Obama did was try to light a different kind of torch, you know, talk about one of the things they've tried to do in contrast to what happened in Cleveland, Margaret, was was, you know, sound a note of joy. And you have to kind of hit a sweet spot, right? Uh, A note of joy and optimism that doesn't suggest that you don't know what the problems are also. The most important thing, I think, now is to acknowledge the problems because that's all Donald Trump does. Mm -hmm. So you can only briefly, you can only have a moment of joy before you then have to say, but I understand that the recovery has not helped everyone, and then pay homage to those people who are suffering, and indeed they are. Um, But Obama is a kind of joyful person. It, It comes across that way to me. I know that he's cool, and he didn't call enough people, and he doesn't schmooze with politicians, but he seems to me a happy man, and he does have that killer smile. And it was quite a spe- – I've seen a lot of them, but it was quite a speech inside the hall. And I, I think he mixed the problems we still have with the joy. And his best line was, uh, I think it's hard to get excited for Hillary, but he seemed genuinely excited about her. Mm. It made me think again, um, because I have more reservations than excitement, uh, when he said she's, she's going to be a better president than me or Bill. Now, that's saying something. Well, she said she, he said she's more qualified. He didn't say she's well, going to be better. Qualified. Well, uh, uh. it came out being a net positive for her over, you know, a, a, an admission by him of her qualifications as to his and, and the big dog. I, I thought it was a pretty effective line. And she, Hillary's been happy twice uh, this week. No, last week. Uh, when she appeared with Tim Kaine, she seemed genuinely happy. And last night when she walked out on stage, she seemed really happy. Uh, I don't see enough of Hillary happy. Uh, so it was, it was good to see. Um, you know, Tim Noah, uh, that was certainly the most positive uh, note that he sounded last night. Uh, but Obama, I think, uh, kind of went out on a limb right at the end of the speech there. Or maybe this isn't a limb at all. But, you know, at the end of the speech, he kind of summed up and talked about uh, the world of his grandparents and, and the kind and the world that they the America that they knew that that made them all patriots and, and the things that are great about America. And then he ended. That's why anyone who threatens our values, whether fascist or communist 
communist or jihadist or homegrown demagogues will always fail in the end. And, you know, it's the first time I've ever heard anybody clearly, at least implicitly, lumping Donald Trump in with jihadists, uh, the exact people that uh, Donald Trump claims to be the cure for. And it it struck me, I don't know, did it strike you as a rhetorical risk or something that needed to be said? Uh, well, you know, I, I I I was mostly struck by the fact that 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 uh, Obama's speech, as as so much of the Democratic convention has been, has been about Donald Trump. I mean, the Republican convention was mostly about Donald Trump. The Democratic convention has also mostly been about Donald Trump. He he just really does seem to uh, suck in all the air uh, in the room, um, uh, no matter no matter where you are, and. Um, uh, I, I think that, that that was an example of that. I, I actually didn't think that Obama's speech was a great speech, uh, particularly when compared uh, to his wife's speech a couple days earlier. Uh, you know, I thought it was kind of a it was kind of a B plus Obama speech, um, and uh, and whereas uh, uh, his wife really knocked it out of the park. Did you did you like his speech last night? Did you like? I mean, Biden certainly went for the gut. Uh, did you like that speech better, Tim? I thought it was a bit better, and I'm also going to voice a minority view, which was I was – I should also say I am not inside the arena. I was okay. watching on television. I'm in Washington. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised by Tim Kaine's speech. I thought it was actually much better than I expected. I thought it was lively, um, and, uh, and I thought he um, took some very effective punches at, uh, at Donald Trump. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of one thing – when, when – uh, the Democrats talk about Donald Trump. It seems to me they don't talk quite enough about the fact that um, he is persona non grata with much of his own party. Mm-hmm. And, and he, 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 he did talk a bit about that, about how Kasich didn't go to the convention. And, you know, I understand that that, that can be tricky, that you can actually make somebody look good by saying that he has alienated people in both parties. But, um, uh, you know the the fact that the republican standard bearer uh is 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 someone that many prominent republicans including almost every um living former presidential candidate who's a republican the exception being dole the fact that they won't support him that that's that's a powerful point mm. um margaret one thing that i was puzzled about or troubled by last night is that even as the president spoke and and he was you know hitting some very very interesting grace notes in this speech i kept hearing all this, this sort of squawking and noise coming from the crowd there that it, it is it seemed as though maybe the the sanders dissidents even now, even then on Wednesday night, hadn't been quite brought into line and they felt kind of free to make noise close to microphones uh, so that we could hear it back home. I don't know. What did it seem like there? You know, I think the the, the fever broke um, and it will be totally gone by November. If you if you look what it was like on Monday as compared to last night, but. Yeah, there still are. And if you, you know, if you gave up a year of your life, uh, as some did, I mean, the, the, those delegates are different from you know, the your normal delegate who's been in party politics for a long time. These are new people and they're passionate and they've they've just given everything to it because they 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 care so much. Um, it takes longer, but I didn't see that much. Of it. I mean, I was in the hall. And you'd hear something, you know, up in the up in the stands, and then you couldn't find it. You know, I mean, you didn't know how many people it was, but it seemed to be a few voices. It didn't seem to be a lot. Um, but I don't think it's going to go away entirely. And 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 you know, there will be you know a moment of truth where can can you you want change? You're like the Donald Trump base voter. You want change. Is this enough for you? Have you come around um, and pulled the lever for Hillary Clinton, who who beat your guy? You know, Tim Noah, it's possible that we just sort of overvalue oratory and spend too much time rating it at these conventions. But even given that, you know, you describe Obama as having given a B-plus speech last night. That might be good news for Hillary Clinton. I mean, there have been some good speeches and some average speeches given over the first three days. Uh, I mean, ultimately, she she has to hit the power cord, you know, at the end of this rock concert. And, and you, what are your thoughts about you know, what does she need to do tonight? 
I think she needs to uh, she needs to give a very good speech. I think it would be helpful if she gave a better speech than than her husband did. Uh, I think Bill Clinton, as usual, gave a, a really terrific speech on her behalf at this convention, um, talking in great detail about um, her commitment to um, public policy uh, in a compelling way, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, and I think she needs to talk about that. I think she needs to offer a positive uh, 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 case for her candidacy. She needs to take a few shots at Donald Trump, but I think it would be unwise for her to spend very much time talking about Trump. I think uh, uh, she, she uh, I, I assume her, her strategy is to leave that mostly to other people. She'll have plenty of opportunities in the rest of the campaign to uh, to go after Trump. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a tricky task because uh, she's been around an awfully long time. I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton entered the White House um, before my first child was born. My first child is now 23 years old and a college graduate. So she's been around a really long time. And uh, that's a bit of a challenge. You know, I think the press is a little bit bored with her because there's not a lot left to say about her. Um, whether you love her or you hate her or you're indifferent to her, um, everybody's pretty much in possession of the same set of facts. You know, some of those facts are paranoid fantasies, but uh, um, apart from debunking some of the things about her that aren't true, I don't think there's very much in the way of new information that anybody's going to be able to provide about Hillary Clinton, least of all herself. Um, I think that... Uh, the best version of Hillary Clinton that I've seen campaigning is this kind of happy warrior. Um, I think she does it pretty well. And um, if she can convey that in her speech, I think she'll, uh, she'll be well served. Um, I, I, I can't let this moment pass, Margaret Carlson, without going to you about this, because I know uh, you had some problems, at least with the first 10 minutes or so, of Bill Clinton's speech on Tuesday night. Uh, I, I thought it was more like 10 hours. Uh, but around me, people were uncomfortable. And it wasn't until he got to the parts that Tim was talking about, you know, her actual record, how she helped people getting to the Senate and, and beyond, that people were were relieved and, you know, applauding and excited. Um, I, I don't know why Bill Clinton would unpack his own baggage uh, like that, when people, uh, those who support her, a lot of them have just put the whole uh, Bill and Hillary relationship aside. You know, let's let's just stipulate not to think about it. So you don't want to think about it for 15 minutes at the convention. So she can certainly do better than Bill Clinton. Um, I liked Obama's speech. I like most of his speeches. I think he's the last person who can give a formal speech um, and 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 be convincing, uh, sweep you along it, with a kind of a beginning and a middle and an end, and he builds up. I, I, I like that old oratory. When it comes out of other people, it seems old-fashioned. And what Donald Trump has done is, uh, you know, he's the Twitter candidate, and at every rally, I went maybe to five or six, he, he'd come out and he just start chatting about the morning news and the polls and then he'd appeal to you know he'd get a little more um uh oratorical and getting the crowd to chant but hillary only has one note uh the only time i i saw her not give a speech at full throttle was after she won new york in brooklyn in the white suit if you remember that night mm -hmm. and she talked in a normal tone, and it was it was great. Uh, first of all, she was happy. She's better when she's happy, aren't we all? <laughs> um, and uh, you know what Tim mentioned about her, you know, the barnstorming. When she's with somebody that she really likes, she's so great. When she was with Ed Rendell in Pennsylvania, which is my home state, in '08, she was great. He brought out the best in her. I think they went bowling or did something. And by the way, she had the blue collar vote then. She had it against Obama. 
she needs to get some of it. I mean, it would certainly help if if you know she could she could make that appeal again. But you know, the other thing about these Democratic conventions is there's a lot of save the whale and the you know the biggest cheer is not when you know you say and and the and let's honor our first responders and police. It's for LGBT and God love them. That's great, but you know the party has to get tethered to the ground about what people care about um, in their own lives. And she could do some of that tonight. I mean, you don't hear much about, like, poverty. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you hear the word poverty? I I haven't, I don't think I've heard it. I also don't hear much about uh, the thing that I cover uh, day to day these days at Politico, which is um, labor and employment policy. Uh, uh, You don't hear much about labor unions. You don't hear much about... Um, uh, uh, well, you hear a bit about raising the minimum wage. Don't hear much about this overtime rule that Obama put out uh, a couple of months ago, which is going to be a big change uh, for working people. Um, there is still a bit of a sense, I think, at Democratic conventions that it's a little bit vulgar to talk about economic issues, and that's that's really got to change. Well, yeah, Tim, I you know you've you got a book coming out about inequality, and I thought that that was the theme of this uh, election, that one way or another, each party is making that case. Trump is saying, look, a lot of you got left behind by the globalization of economy. Uh, I'm going to do something about it. It's a little unclear what it is that he's going to do about it. And and I, I once again assume that Democrats, uh, they may find it vulgar to talk about money and employment and stuff like that, but uh, to be, be able to talk about inequality, that that would seem to be right down the the heart of the plate for them, and and so if I this, think it is moving. I think the party is moving in a direction towards talking about uh, 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 economic issues, uh, economic liberalism more than it did previously. But in terms of solutions, it's still um, quite timid, as evidenced by the fact that the. Um, the main policy that's being embraced by both Trump and Hillary Clinton is uh, protectionism. Um, you know, there are an awful lot of other approaches to uh, income inequality that um, uh, uh, you can talk about uh, without um, uh, talking about uh, 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 the trade issue, which is a complex one and, um, uh, you know, very problematic uh, uh, you can talk about uh, you're hearing very little, for example, about um, changing labor law to empower labor unions. Um, you know, if you're really concerned about income inequality, uh, it seems uh, to me, and I've, I've sort of said this to audiences talking about my book, is you know, if if you want to reverse income inequality and you're not interested in uh, uh, changing the laws to uh, strengthen labor unions, then you're wasting your time. Take up chess. Um, that's a, uh, a central part of uh, the program because it's a central reason why uh, there's been so much growth in income inequality since 1979, the decline of labor unions. It's been a huge part of it. You've seen a shift from, um, within GDP from, uh, from, capital, from labor to capital. And, you know, that shouldn't surprise anybody. That's exactly what you would expect at a time when labor unions are declining in power. Um, but, uh, you know, there is very little of that sense. And that's, you know, that's very much part of an older message for the Democrats. And it's, it's a difficult message because labor unions are on the ropes, um, absolutely. Uh, it's a difficult message because uh, the white working class, which makes up a large part of unions' constituency, is um, uh, very enamored of Donald Trump. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I continue to be surprised that um, there's very little conversation around those issues. Oh, we're talking to Tim Noah and Margaret Carlson. You know, Margaret, just to go back to kind of almost a stylistic point, it, it does seem watching the, the flavor of the two conventions, watching the flavor of this convention, Hillary Clinton has always, often been compared to Tracy Flick, the character played by Reese Witherspoon in the movie Election. But, you know, somebody who's who's very serious uh, about achievement, somebody who wants to bring arguments of merit and competence uh, and sanity, to use Michael Bloomberg's equation from last night, 
right, uh, to the table. And, and surrounding her are, are other people making similar arguments uh, about uh, about merit and, and about understanding policies and uh, understanding uh, the basic premises of government. And you have guys like Joe Biden, who's just sort of a career public servant. Um, and also Joe Biden, a guy who bounces back from, from horrible tragedies uh, and, and comes back with a smile, ready to roll up his sleeves and go to work again. And the Republican convention, led by Trump and, and maybe some of the other Trumpian speakers, seem very much like the kid in the back row, the you know, Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, or, or pick your favorite bad kids from a John Hughes movie, who, who are, are making a fundamentally anti-intellectual argument, saying, don't pay any attention to the nerds and the wonks and the people who tell you that they've got a white paper about this or that they've read a briefing book. That's not going to work. This other kind of ins- brutish, instinctual way of governing is, is going to be much more effective. And, you know, t- to that extent, it seems as though they aren't really competing messages. They're messages aimed at completely different groups of people, that one group of people would be incapable of listening to the other message. Uh, you have the the candidate of 10-point plans. They don't, they don't, uh, doesn't have, you know, 10 10-point plans, and it doesn't have everything that, that Tim is talking about. But it's more than people will sit still for at the moment if the polls are to be believed. Trump never says, I don't think he's ever said how he's going to do anything. Maybe he said something about the material he's going to use to bribe bar that he's going to use to build the wall. Mm -hmm. But I've never heard I've never heard any discussion of how he's going to do any of the things he throws out there. Um, But he's more in tune with the mood than she is. Because we're at the end of eight years of Obama. People traditionally want change. She doesn't look like change, but she is the one. She's the she's the the girl who always did her homework. And if you miss class, you'd want her notes. Uh, she oozes competence and qualifications. Um, you know, her job is to look a little looser. His job well, you know, I don't know what his job is because he seems to be appealing to a lot of people. Um, you know, the best line, and not just because I work at a place called Bloomberg because, you know, the mayor doesn't have anything to do with what I do, but when he said, I'm from New York and I know a con man when I see one, to to him and to lots of others, you can't believe that people can look at this guy and think he's going to help them because right. there's nothing – in his background, there's nothing he's done. In fact, to the contrary, he doesn't help anybody but himself, and he'll sacrifice anything. But it, you know, even my saying it, I'm sure your eyes are glazing over because no one, it doesn't hit. It just, you know, I was at this breakfast this morning, and people were asking me to explain it. I can't explain it. I can't explain that there could be that much anger that you're willing to vote for somebody who. You're you're pretty sure. I mean, you'd have to at three in the morning when you wake up. No, he's not going to help you. But um, you're so mad. <laughs> you're so mad at these people, and you're so mad at both parties. You're as mad at Mitch McConnell as you are at Harry Reid. You just—they're all in cahoots. And so, by God, you're going to cast your vote for the charlatan. That seems to be what's propelling a lot of these. You know, I went to my hometown of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for one of his rallies at the farm show building where I remembered, you know, cotton candy and fried Twinkies. And the place was full. And, yes, Harrisburg is in the middle of Pennsylvania, what James Carville called Alabama. But I grew up there. It wasn't like that. You know, they, the, the Republicans were more mainstream Republicans. It wasn't a rabid, uh, conservative, evangelical area now it now it is something i can't describe and i can't fit it into the republican party but there they were and and they're motivated by emotion and so motivated they might cast their vote that way all right we have to so do- i don't know how somebody like hillary copes with that in pennsylvania she's you know she's got pennsylvania i mean she's got philadelphia so if she if she gets obama and it close to obama's margin she can probably uh, compensate for what looks to me like everything from, you know, the steel towns of Beaver County um, up through the middle of the state uh, north. She, you know, she can compensate for that. But boy, does she have to turn out 
those people. All right, Margaret Carlson, it's been so great to hear your voice again, columnist for Bloomberg View. Uh, She's going to go and try to get some decent food before she heads out for the Wells Fargo Center. Tim Noah is going to stay with us a a little while longer. Brian Curtis from The Ringer is going to join us after this. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool and all shooting some b-ball outside of the school. When a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. Well, it turns out the, that uh, Fresh Prince can still get the producers and the tweet masters up and dancing there in the booths. Uh, it's getting pretty exciting. We've been waiting all week to play that, actually, and so we're so happy we did. Uh, Tim Noah, uh, who's labor and employment editor for Politico and author of The Great Divergence, America's Growing Inequality Crisis and What We Can Do About It, uh, joins us, uh, stays with us. Uh, Brian Curtis is joining us now, editor-at-large at The Ringer. Uh, the last time he was with us, it was t- to talk about golf. Uh, now it's, uh, I-, I guess we're, we're playing a different course or, or something, uh, and it's harder and harder to know what the rules are. So yesterday, you know, I, I I was sitting down to write my column, and I had the TV on, and I was sort of thinking, well, you know, the Democrats really still have quite a few problems. They haven't solved them all. They're heading into a convention with this WikiLeaks mess on their hands, Brian Curtis. They've had to uh, cashier their uh, their national chairman. The Bernie natives are still pretty restless. It's not clear that they have the reconciliation that they need. So the smart thing to do if you're Donald Trump is to stand pat, not say very much, don't create more news. Just let this little fire uh, burn over there in Philadelphia. And I suddenly look over and he's having a press conference where he's saying all this crazy stuff, you know, and confusing John Hinckley with David Hinckley and confusing Tim Kaine with Tom Keene and then talking about how the Russians should hack, uh, the, you know, uh, should find Hillary's emails in the course of their hack. And and it just seemed like really bad strategy. I mean, just to do, you know, I mean, Casey Stengel famously said about the Mets, can't nobody hear play this game and i thought is does he not know how to play this game or does he know how to play it better than i know it brian what's your take on that (laughs) another mulligan to stay with the golf metaphor right i mean i think he's um i think the big thing is he just didn't like being in a spotlight he didn't like uh everyone talking about the other party for four days and you know that's that is trump's magic that he never stops talking and it is his uh downfall that he never stops talking so he makes news and completely makes everything, you know, difficult and annoying about the Democratic convention for two days look like totally minor stuff when he invites the Russians to uh, to hack the Democrats on his behalf. Um, Tim, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this. I know that you've even speculated that they're almost I mean, using our normal decades of of experience covering politics, he's doing a lot of things that you would do if you were trying to tank your own campaign. Although maybe right. we're just yeah, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Based on past elections. I mean, you know, remember, George Romney did himself in by making a little joke about being brainwashed about Vietnam, uh, uh, you know. Ed Muskie uh, was done in by uh, complaining about a nasty newspaper article about his wife uh, standing uh, outside in New Hampshire, and some reporters thought maybe he had tears in his eyes, although other reporters thought it was just a melting snowflake. I mean, these utterly trivial things that destroyed candidates in the past uh, uh, you compare these to to the long uh, list of things that um, uh, Trump has said, um, all of them that, that appeared to experience reporters to be without question disqualifying. And uh, the latest one is his open invitation to uh, uh, the Russians to hack uh, his opponent's email. It's it's. Um, uh, you know, it's giving a lot of reporters that feeling of, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Um, I, I wanted to quote something. Uh, we, you know, Margaret was talking earlier, expressing you know, the usual puzzlement that most people have about uh, Trump's uh, appeal to the white working class. And one of the better things that I've read lately on this was something that was posted this week by Michael Moore, who – um, you know, somebody I, I find myself often looking askance at, but uh, he understands the white working class. I don't think you can take that away from him. And um, uh, he talked in this piece about uh, what he called the Jesse Ventura effect. Let me quote this. 
Uh, do not discount the electorate's ability to be mischievous or underestimate how many millions fancy themselves as closet anarchists once they draw the curtain and are all alone in the voting booth. It's one of the few places left in society where there uh, are no security cameras, no listening devices, no spouses, no kids, no boss, no cops. There's not even a friggin' time limit. You can take as long as you need in there, and nobody can make you do anything. You can push the vote. Uh, you can push the button and vote a straight party line, or you can write in Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. There are no rules, and because of that, and the anger that so many have toward a broken political system, millions are going to vote for Trump not because they agree with him, not because they like his bigotry or ego, but just because they can, just because it will upset the apple cart and make mommy and daddy mad. Um, I think that's that's you know uh, an interesting approach, and 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 it it it, it might explain why um, the more uh, Trump uh, appears to be beyond the pale by the usual rules of political discourse, the greater his appeal uh, for his backers. He's the bad boy, um, and. Uh, by that uh, uh, template, it's hard to imagine him saying anything that, you know, he could say, you know, I possess cloven hooves and the mark of the beast. And, you know, uh, he might go up 10 points in the polls. Well, I want to go back to this Russia thing for just a second here, because, I mean, there's sort of what he said, Brian, and also what we're trying to piece together. And I really do feel as though we've once again moved into this territory that something that, that what would have sounded like crazy talk two and a half weeks ago is now this thing where we're trying to puzzle out whether it could be true or not. And specifically what I mean is if two and a half weeks ago I said, I said well, the Russians are going to hack into some Democratic um, email accounts and voicemails uh, and then give them to Julian Assange, who, by the way, is like turning into some kind of Bond villain. All he needs is like a white cat to sit on his lap. But and give them to Julian Assange for the purpose of derailing the Clinton candidacy and creating an advantage for Trump, who, because of his own and his advisor's business connections in Russia and Ukraine, is a much more sympathetic and anti-NATO candidate. So the Russians are going to try to 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 monkey wrench this election. You would have sat me over in the corner with Alex Jones, and you know, <laughs> right? And, but now we're sort of trying to figure out, well, could that be right? No, it's true. I mean, I think Franklin Four, who's actually an old colleague of both Tim and I, uh, wrote a piece in Slate a couple of weeks ago, sort of laying out the kind of, you know, prima facie case that Trump and the Russians were in league in some way. And, you know, to add to your laundry list, right, Trump wondering aloud if he's fulfilled NATO commitments, uh, wondering aloud, you know, about the Crimea, wondering uh, all it's changing the Republican platform to make it... Uh, more favorable to Putin a couple of days last week. And and you're right, it was unbelievable, and it was absolutely unthinkable, like much of the Trump candidacy. And then as we've gotten in and gotten in, I remember sent somebody an email, it's like, this is not a coincidence, right? <laughs> These things keep happening, you know? Trump doesn't have a lot of message discipline, but he has said so many things that are favorable to Putin. And at this point, uh, yeah, I think we are in the, uh, we, we're beyond Alex Jones, right? Alex Jones is becoming reality. And, you know, you saw a couple of speakers take a couple of swipes at it last time. That just seems like it should be a major theme of the Democratic Convention and not something, as you say, that's kind of in the air and in the background and sort of boiling away while we're we're all talking here in Philadelphia. Yeah. It, it, Tim Noah, you would remember, as I do, uh, in the 90s when there was uh, a huge scandal of the idea that Chinese money might be getting into uh, an American election. I mean, this was really regarded as, you know, a, a major emergency. Right now, it's sort of not clear to what degree it would be a major emergency if Russia really had an agenda vis-a-vis -vis this election and was capable of pursuing it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's it's too early to know what how it's how it's polling. But, uh, it, it, you know, it is strange. It's out there and it's more outlandish than any of us could have imagined. Uh, and Trump is 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 saying outlandish things about it. it. You asked me earlier about this 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 whole Max Bialystok theory of of Donald <laughs> Trump. Uh, for, for those who've seen the producers, uh, the, the plot line of the producers is about a con man who who. Um, uh, uh, puts on a Broadway show and and he he sells many 
many thousands uh, percentages in, in, the, in the proceeds from it, so it has to fail. And that's, that's the con. Uh, and it's all dependent on the show failing, and it turns out to be a surprise success, and, and the con man goes to jail. Well, uh, you know, the, as applied to Trump, the theory would be that, that you know, Trump got into this presidential election as a lark, um, uh, enjoyed the attention enormously, uh, never really wanted to be president, and is now starting to panic at the prospect that he might be president. You know, there have been little stories here and there where he said some very weird things about actually being president. Uh, Robert Draper had a story last week about uh, an aide to John Kasich being told by uh, Donald Trump Jr. that the vice president uh, will have the job of running domestic yes. and foreign policy. Uh, and there was an earlier story where Trump seemed to be making a joke about walking away from the job. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be conscious. It could be unconscious. Um, Look, being president of the United States isn't a whole lot of fun. Mm. Um, I think we can, I, I've never been president of the United States, but that seems to be, uh, on the evidence, it seems to be true. It ages people. It's a very trying job. Uh, and um, it does not consist of having large crowds adore you all the time. It often uh, consists of the precise opposite. Uh, does Trump have a sense of that? Um, he's not a stupid man. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying I endorse this theory. All I'm saying is that it's not. I find it less ridiculous today than I did three months ago. You know, I, I read that same article, Brian Curtis, and I did have this very, you know, sort of almost Dickensian Bob Cratchit-like image of Mike Pence sitting there with briefing books piled all around him, while President Trump is like a judge <laughs> on America's Got Talent or something. And I was like, well, let me know how this works out, Mike. It's just, you know, I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll make good decisions. But you know, having visited both of these conventions, um, you know, I, I want you to maybe um, talk, maybe even push back a little little bit against the Michael Moore idea, because watching them on television, and I don't know what it's like being there this time, but watching them on television, one distinction I would make is that, you know, in the Michael Moore thing, yeah, he's kind of describing this Spicoli America. Spicoli was the character Sean Penn played uh, in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, who had like a pizza delivered to him at math class or something. Um, but that's that looks like fun. The Republican convention never looked like fun to me. It looked like a lot of people who were really, really angry, whereas what I see on television is this kind of hopey, changey, huggy, kissy, uh, happy environment there in Philly. Oh, absolutely. It's it's more it's even more soothing and warm in inside the arena. You have all these ushers wearing yellow shirts and on the back of their shirt in big letters it says, ask me, you know, ask me anything. Where's my seat? Where can I go to the red? There's a there is an all gender restroom on the second floor of the of, you know, just to make sure everybody is perfectly comfortable. And, you know, one of the refrains we heard inside the arena at the RNC was lock her up, lock her up. Right. Especially during Chris Christie's speech. Well, at the DNC, I noticed last night when Tim Kaine was reeling off all of Trump's business misdeeds. Uh, a small lock him up chant started in the balcony, and immediately the delegates turned and shushed it. No, we can't have that here. You know, I mean, even though even though there may be a better case to send Trump to jail than Clinton to jail, uh, you know that was just seen as absolutely beyond the pale. And you know that's that's that is the thing. And I think especially it was really interesting last night when you noticed the part of the program the Democrats devoted to gun violence. Right uh, at the RNC, there had been so much talk of violence and shootings to the to create this image of America going down the tubes. Right to make it Nixon's convention in 1968. And last night, you know, the Democrats invoked it, but then the message was we can overpower it with love. And speaking of Max Bialystok, you have all these Broadway stars coming on the stage, right, and and saying, you know, what the world needs now is love. You know, and, and you have, you know, Lenny Kravitz singing about love. And you have, you know, people, this this very su sweet little old lady from Ohio, as she described herself, coming out and saying, yes. I wish every American could give President Obama a hug. <laughs> and you're absolutely right, Colin. The, the theme inside, the feeling that is going all over the Wells Fargo Center is let's all hug each other and love can defeat all. And I mean, Tim Noah, the the only problem will be if that's not what America, if Michael Moore is right, and that's not really what Americans want to do. They don't want to participate in that kind of climate. They want to make mischief. They want to uh, uh, strew chaos. Then that message is not going to work. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 
that is a message that is sculpted for the white working class, especially the older white working class. Um, uh, somebody did a, a poll recently that said that um, if you poll uh, members of the white working class, they, they say that uh, uh, bias against white people is now worse than bias against black people. The sense of victimization, um, you know, some of it legitimate uh, because of uh, economic circumstances, uh, but there's also a strong sense of racial victimization. Uh, there's a kind of powerful resentment of liberals. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think you can talk about this without dragging in Fox News, which, which um, is also just sort of perfectly sculpted to this demographic. It's more coherently conservative than, than Donald Trump is, but, you know, sort of the mood at Fox News is um, this kind of endlessly sour uh, complaint about the mistreatment of anyone uh, who had the bad manners to be, to be white, uh, and especially white and male. Uh, the complaints never end. Bill O'Reilly actually went on TV yesterday um, uh, and, and uh, about his latest controversy uh, uh, and, and, and said, they're trying to kill me. Um, uh, the, the sort of level of hatred and paranoia is, is, has reached sort of toxicity levels that are, are truly unbelievable. Um, the New York Times today had a wonderful story about how uh, apparently uh, a lot of the old hands at Fox News aren't speaking to Megyn Kelly because she was a stoolie uh, to the investigators uh, uh, who, who were asking questions about whether uh, Roger Ailes um, had harassed her sexually. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the music of, the, uh, of Fox News, and it's the music of the Trump campaign, and it's got a ceiling. It appeals to a particular group, which is um, uh, the white working class. My guess is it doesn't even especially appeal very much to the younger uh, members of the white working class. Um, and... Uh, Hillary's best hope is that she can sort of contain Trump's appeal uh, to that group. We are seeing signs that for the first time the Republican Party is actually separating out um, the white working class from, um, uh, uh, from white, uh, white collar workers. Mm -hmm. You're seeing um, uh, basically sort of uh, give, a, give a Republican uh, a college degree and he seems to migrate to the Hillary camp. Um, you know, we haven't really seen that before. Um, and uh, so there's still, I think, some serious questions to raise about whether there are enough people in this group to actually elect Donald Trump president. It's enough to sustain Fox News at the moment, although even Fox News is, is scratching its head and wondering how long um, it's going to be able to get strong ratings by appealing to uh, this, you know, sort of very elderly uh, group of uh, angry uh, voters. Well, we think uh, we worry about that all the time on public radio, too. So, uh, Tim Noah, uh, Tim Noah, I've got to take a little break here. Uh, thank you so much. It's so great to hear your voice on our airwaves. We're going to come back with somebody who's really having a lot of fun, except speaking of music, there's some music she doesn't like that much. Alexandra Petri will join us at the end. <laughs> Projection, another deception, another solution. All hail deception. All right, want to thank uh, Betsy Kaplan for producing today's show. Jonathan McNichols handling handling the technical side. Greg Hills, our tweet master at WNPR. Colin, I don't think there's an intern in there. Part of Bill Curry was played by Condoleezza Rice. Now, uh, if you're unhappy, if you're sad, if you need uh, something to make you laugh, at minimum, just jump on Twitter and follow Alexandra Petri, or better yet, seek out her compost blog for The Washington Post. She's also the author of A Field Guide to Awkward Silences. So, Alexandra, I've been saving a few people just for you, and I think the main person that I've been saving just for you to uh, to carve up in your very special way uh, is Tim Kaine. So you've got a theory that Tim Kane is what America's new stepdad? Yes, I think, but in like that positive way, I thought somebody was saying like he's that guy when you he's like the youth pastor who makes you think, hey, maybe Jesus isn't so uncool after all. Like he's gonna make you snacks, he's gonna pull up in his minivan, and he's gonna sing some harmonica songs to you. 
Right. There, there were some people who sort of thought, well, he's got this kind of teddy bear quality to him, but now he's really trying to say this really tough stuff, this vice presidential, you know, attack dog stuff about Trump. How do you reconcile those two things? But you think he's kind of the stepdad who what? When you stay out past curfew and come in late, he doesn't tell your mom? Yeah, he's, he's like not mad. He's just disappointed. But then you take like the lesson away where, you know, he'll sit you down and he'll talk to you about like brain development and responsibility. And then you'll go up to your room and you'll think, gee, you know, I didn't realize what I was doing to myself. So it, paradoxically, uh, it might actually be a more effective approach than more angry shouting. Because you can't beat Donald Trump with a game of angry shouting. He has like a master's in that from Wharton. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, one of the things that you have not liked is a, a piece of music prepared for us by the great Elizabeth, Elizabeth Banks, who do- dominates all aspects of our culture. We'll just play a little tiny bit of fight song just so you can start no. retro. Here it goes. I might only have one match, but I can make an explosion. And all those things I didn't say, wrecking balls inside my brain. I will scream and loud tonight. Can you hear? Fortunately for Alexandra, we're almost out of time anyway, so I can't play the whole song. But it's got all these celebrities. It's John Michael Higgins and people like that. And then you see, you know, uh, I don't know, Idina Menzel and, and Kristen Chenoweth. And why don't you like this nice song, Alexandra? Look, well, my basic theory on this is that the two conventions have the job of spelling us their candidates. And they have a, I think the Democratic convention has a simpler job than the Republican convention because Donald Trump by all accounts, doesn't know what the Constitution says, and he's sort of a dangerous, roving id. And who people say he poses, poses like an existential threat to the country. And Hillary Clinton is Hillary Clinton. So all you really have to do is point at your candidate and say, mine's the one who isn't on fire. Let's just go with that one. And instead, they're trying to be hip. And they're always like, look, we have some celebrities coming out of our ears, like Scott Bio is the only one you have at yours. But we've got Elizabeth Banks. She's here to play Effie Trinket to America. And so you... You don't need to do all the bells and whistles. If like yours isn't the one that's on fire, all you need to do is say that. You don't need to be like, and it's bedazzled, and it's got sequins, and also the acapella. Like, if I have to see one more hip acapella response, because like 2008, everyone kept coming in and being like, oh, Will I Am is going to make a song about change. And so now they're like, oh, we have to do that. But like, just because somebody did it once and it was good doesn't mean you have to keep forcing us to watch like celebrities mouth along to hip music. Um, Alexander. Alexander, before we run out of time here, which we are about to do, one of the pleasures of any convention is meeting the people who aren't up on stage and sometimes are strangely dressed and have uh, bizarre things to say. They're often out in the streets, not in the hall. Uh, Give us your favorite person you've met so far. Well, my favorite person was an alpaca, actually. (laughs) Uh, Now, under what circumstances did you meet an alpaca? uh, He was protesting outside of the DNC. He was also very wet because it was hot, and so his owner had to keep pouring water over him. I think, or her. I'm not uh, well versed in my alpaca anatomy. Yeah, no, you but, shouldn't try to sex an alpaca without uh, some training. What, what, what was the alpaca protesting? Uh, the alpaca wanted, I think, more sustainable farming conditions. <laughs> Something to do with farming. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, a, a convention is always a pleasure in a strange way, particularly. Is this your first one? This is my second. I actually went to Tampa. Oh, yeah, okay. So so you've been through this before. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, uh, and people should absolutely uh, follow Al- Alexander Petri on Twitter. It's one of the really fun and funny constant Twitter feeds during the convention. Uh, don't try to get along without it. We are going to have to go, but this has been a load of fun, and thanks very much to uh, Betsy Kaplan, who produced the whole thing, and as we say, Jonathan McNichol on the board. We're going to be back with the nose tomorrow. We've all been watching The Night Of, which was originally intended to be a drama starring James Gandolfini. It stars John Turturro instead. We're going to talk about it. It's not unrelated to this particular convention season and some of the attitudes about lesser and marginalized people in the American fabric. She gonna let it